Uh, welcome everyone. Today we have uh, the pleasure to host and listen uh, to the case study of Olivier Costa and Tom Jans, two less practitioners uh, who managed to help the Belgian Federal Pension Service, uh, the company from the public sector, uh, to become more flexible. We will go over uh, the timeline about uh, two years, uh, what, what, uh, what has been happening uh, in uh, the Federal Pension Service in Belgium. Uh, we will look at uh, how it has impacted the organization, um, how uh, co-learning as, as, as an organization was able to help uh, there and assist uh, the, the transitions and all the, the things that needed to happen uh, and uh, what the effect is on the organization. So we also have Aud with us, the, the product owner. Uh, Tom is uh, one of the, of the lead scrum masters uh, in, uh, of this endeavor. Um, and Maybe Tom, you can you can um, go a little bit over the, the in the in the introduction, uh, introducing the the protagonists of this story. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, uh, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm an internal agile coach and, and scrum master. So I work for the Federale Pensioendienst, the pension service. Um, I've been uh, yeah working there as an agile coach for a few years now, and since. I guess September last year, I made a promotion to be a Scrum Master in the in the Les Bubble, uh, which I was very happy about. Um, so yeah, I will take you through through our journey of the last yeah more than two uh, two years and maybe a bit longer even. Um, we have today with us Aud. She's the payments product owner. Um, yeah, that's her. <laughs> um, Stefan couldn't make it today. He's, uh, he's our director. Um, me, uh, like I said, I'm uh, one of the Scrum Masters. Um, we had a lot of help from co-learning. Uh, Jürgen came to do a, a, a training with us in February 2017, no, 18 it is. Um, Thierry helped us a lot in the, in the first part, in the No More Majors part, which uh, we'll go into a lot more detail uh, soon. And then right now we have the honor to have uh, Olivier Costa in our team, uh, in our teams, helping out uh, specifically to help us get better at technical excellence. So um, we'll just dive in. Um, so, and like I said, I'm, my name is Tom. Uh, I will be telling this story mostly from my own point of view as an internal change agent. Um, and just because I hope it can help or maybe even inspire some other people that are working hard to make their own organization better. I know that being an internal change agent requires a lot of energy and a lot of persistence. Sometimes it might feel like you're alone shouting in the desert. But like I always keep in mind that I'm doing the right thing. And in fact, there's nothing more rewarding than that. And definitely nothing better for the soul than that. And when I was preparing for this, I realized if you look back, say three years, um, and you compare the situation then and the situation now, you know you can have a big impact on your organization and on all your colleagues. Um, so this looking back is uh, what we'll be doing now. Uh, but we'll first of all start with uh, my organization. So who are we? We are the Belgian Federal Pension Service. We are a government agency that is responsible for citizens' legal pensions. We get a lot of data from citizens and employers, uh, other institutions. We apply a bunch of relevant uh, pension and social security laws. We inform the Belgian citizens, and finally we pay them their legal pension. So we pay about three and a half billion euros per month um, to two or two to three million Belgian pensionees. Um, so if you look at revenue, we are actually bigger than Accenture worldwide. Um, we are a, a financial service agency with 11 million customers because all Belgians have pension data that we uh, collect and, and that we process. Um, so digital strategy, automation, customer service, etc., are very important to us. Um, so if you look at this uh, little organogram, um, in total, there are about 2,500 civil servants uh, that work on the, in the pension service. There is a central IT department consisting of roughly 250 people. And there are 
15, 16, 17 development teams, roughly 150 people um, that are working on the on our biggest uh, central in-house developed application, which is called Tisdales. So this application is the one that is used to handle most of the calculations, the payments, the data exchanges, the workflows, etc. Um, so these development teams are divided over two sub-departments. There's an attribution sub-department um, where all the calculations happen about the, the pension. And then there's a, a payment uh, sub-department, um, which is once the, uh, the, the citizen is retired, then obviously they get paid, uh, hopefully correctly. Um, so those development teams are responsible for, responsible for that domain. And then there's a transversal and an uh, infrastructure uh, sub-department. Um, basically because we have four directors, so they all need a department. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even lying. Um, so me personally, I joined this organization about four years ago. It was the result of a merger. I'd been part of a, of a smaller organization and I was there in a team that worked on an old PLSQL and Oracle Forms application. Uh, that is today still in use. It looks uh, very ugly, but it's still used to calculate uh, pensions for civil servants. Um, so back then I was trying hard to get my own team to improve and to move from waterfall to embrace Kanban and WIP limits and all those things. Um, and being young and enthusiastic, I saw mainly all the things that we did wrong. But now I'm a bit less young, but still very enthusiastic. Uh, I can also see that we did some of the things right. Uh, although I didn't realize them at the time. So one of the major things there, putting things in production was basically a non-event. We would just develop stuff and test things in a, a separate staging environment. And whenever it was ready, we would move the modification to the production environment. This could happen multiple times a day, uh, um, multiple times a week in the middle of the day. We would just communicate to the users and that was that. And actually we didn't even have a version control system. Um, the memory of our developers was actually enough. Um, but the bigger organization that we joined, they seemed a lot more advanced in all their agile stuff. So uh, we had three teams that had been trying to move towards agile. And this new organization had more than a dozen teams. They all had impressive sounding names. They were doing scrum and story points and retrospectives and all kinds of other strange things that I'd never heard of. And so, they were all working on this massive application called Tiseos, and I remember being quite overwhelmed and I didn't understand much of it. Um, the thing that puzzled me most probably was after their two weekly sprints, they only still went into production about four times a year. So these major releases, as they were called, they were obviously a major deal. And you could really feel the stress rising as the date came near. All development would stop for a few weeks of code freeze and we would have rooms full of users in manual test ses sessions that could last for days actually just to make sure that the new functionality worked correctly without causing regressions and things that had existed before um, and then obviously once it was released it got even more stressful because there had to be hot fixes and those had to really be rushed out the door so I remember thinking that for all of their fancy scrum that they didn't seem to be all that agile after all. Uh, but of course, as time went on, I got to understand scrum a bit more, it started to make sense. Uh, I also came to the understanding that there's quite a big difference between one team of 10 people working on an application and 15 teams with 150 people working on an application. And actually inside those teams, uh, there were plenty of people who didn't like major releases. And some people were saying that we didn't even need them because we also had a patch release process. So these were kind of minor releases that did happen at the end of every sprint intended for bug fixes and, and more and more teams were actually using this patch release process uh, to release features uh, more and more. So by this time, um, our IT department had been building an agile way of working for a few years. We already had two waves of agile transformations. So we already had stable cross-functional team-ish uh, with a certain degree of autonomy. And we had like quite a wide range of frameworks. Uh, there were teams doing Scrum, Kanban, Scrumban. There was a lot of Scrum, but of course. Um, 
and all to varying degrees of success, but at the team level, it seemed to work. However, we did struggle to bring it all together and like this balance between the autonomy and the coordination uh, was hard to get right. And this was obviously most clear when uh, times got stressful. So it was very clear to see uh, at, uh, at release time. There were teams arguing and not following procedures or getting annoyed that the procedures keep changing and the deadlines keep moving. And in the end, nobody really knew what was going into, uh, into the release. So it was obvious that we needed uh, a better way of, of scaling things up. So early 2018, we invited Jürgen over for uh, the large scale Scrum uh, course internally in, in our organization with, I don't know, something like 20 people. Uh, we'd also invited another trainer to talk about a, a less risky scaling framework. Um, so actually both of these trainings emphasized how important it was to have good technical practices. And we talked a lot about the value of frequent releases. And so this helped us to realize that yes, we would need to invest time and money to get things right, uh, but that this investment would probably be worth it. Um, I personally stole quite a lot of good ideas from that training. Um, the training itself would have, would soon prove to have a big impact um, because it set part of our organization uh, on a path towards less. Though it would take quite some time before all of the negotiations and the procedures would be completed because, you know, we still work in the public sector after all. If you want to spend public money, you have to make really sure that you spend it well. Um, so in the summer, um, we were still uh, talking about should we go to less and how to do it and da da da. Um, but we also had a major release in June. So early July, there was uh, the usual lessons learned uh, session, um, which yeah, was the kind of post-mortem of the, the major release. And I remember preparing for this, se this session, expecting the usual suggestions and the usual complaints to come up. Um, and I told myself to get at least something of value out of it. Uh, maybe it's a good opportunity to experiment with icebreakers and with energizers. And uh, I have to say, there was a lot of energy in the room when uh, somebody suddenly said, you know, we don't really like major releases. Why can't we just get rid of them? Um, best idea ever. Um, but I felt like I had to challenge it a bit. So I told them, but how can we do that? It wouldn't be possible at all. So the more I challenged the 30 or so people in the room, the, the more that the energy started to rise. Uh, and we finished that session with a list of four things that made it difficult to get rid of the major releases. Uh, but more importantly, we realized that everybody seemed to want this and that, hey, maybe perhaps it isn't impossible. So during that summer, I stayed in touch with Jürgen um, and he told me that Belgium's expert on uh, continuous integration Mr. Thierry de Poe was actually available and he was willing to come and spend some time with us. Um, we managed to frame that initiative as a training course and not as a project. This meant for some strange reasons that all the negotiations and procedures were a lot faster. So we could actually aim to start in September. So it seemed that the stars had aligned and that was, uh, it was going to happen. Um, but how would we make it a success? So one thing we knew was that we'd certainly need a group of people to spend a lot of time and effort on this. So we went looking for volunteers to form a No More Majors core group. Um, our plan was to spend one day of workshop every week until the end of the year, because the, the next major release was planned in December. And as you can see here, our plan was to make the major release of December to be the last major release ever. So we planned a two day kickoff session in mid September and that's about as detailed as the preparation was and all the rest we knew we had to figure out as we went on because uh, how hard could it be really. Um, so in that kickoff session, we did a few value stream mappings, both of the major release process, but also for the patch release process. So soon we figured out, let's just focus on the patch release process. Um, can we 
add stuff to it or, or tweak the patch release process to make it stronger so that that process um, can take all the, like, all the things to make sure that we're going to release correctly. Um, so a few things we did. Um, we created uh, one shared build pipeline uh, in Jenkins, which collected all the automated tests that already existed in all the different teams, but we put them together in one place, in one pipeline with obviously a very clear output because it was simple. Green means go. Whatever we have just compiled could go into production and red means stop, right? So this created a very simple and clear view on where we were. Um, what we did as well, we greatly simplified our branching strategy. So for historic reasons, we had a very complicated branching strategy with lots of cherry picking and the master branch is being deleted. Um, so Thierry proposed to start with the, the Git flow branching strategy, uh, which was a, yeah, a simplification and made things a lot more clear for everybody. The plan was that it's maybe a natural progression to make that even simpler. So the plan was after a few months of doing this Git flow that we could go to GitHub where we don't have a developed branch anymore to finally in the long run uh, end up in something more trunk based development. Now, a little spoiler alert, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, however, um, like this seemed, this all seemed quite possible to do. Um, all the technical preparations were, were going well. But so now um, in this new branching strategy and with this shared pipeline, it meant that any problem could stop the whole process and therefore also the release. So every team was uh, heavily impacted. So it was time to go public. Um, every month we have um, an all hands IT meeting. We call it One ICT. So this was the, the, the one ICT of November was the perfect platform to, to announce this big news and to explain all the changes to all the teams. Um, in the months leading up to that, after every uh, No More Major workshop, we, we, would have, we organized show and tell sessions, so a little half an hour uh, summaries of what we worked on that day that we invited everybody to. We communicated about our initiative as much as possible. Um, so everybody knew what was uh, kind of going on. But this time uh, was the first time where it got like really concrete, where we could say, okay, this is the proposal. We can say yes to it or no. Um, and so we, we made presentation um, for, for this one ICT. And so like the first people that uh, we had to, I could explain this was our own management. Um, it was very clear when I sent the presentation on the Friday evening that that understood the proposal, but so far they didn't seem to be saying no. Um, so that put a lot of pressure on us because suddenly everything was in danger. But I think it's a sign of a good team that when there's pressure, um, a good team comes together and doesn't break apart. So that's what we did that day. We made a few modifications. Um, we got together, uh, made a new presentation, said here, dear management, this is what we're going to uh, present on Monday morning. If you have any further feedback or remarks, just let me know. So that could be the beginning of a very busy weekend, but fortunately everything stayed calm. So we did the announcement that Monday. Um, it went really well. There were a few questions, but everybody seemed to be aligned. Um, and so this was half November. There was a major release coming up in December, which would take a lot of our time, of course. Um, but we managed to finish all these um, technical preparations. And so the major release of December happened and we went into this uh, new process. The third week of January, we had the first um, yeah, two weekly release and 
uh, everything went fine. Actually, it went better than expected. It felt like a normal patch release process, even though the underlying process had uh, immensely changed. Um, so basically in the space of four months, we managed to go from yeah, four releases, usually two a year, to uh, doing full releases every two weeks. Um, this, of course, had a big effect on the organization, uh, even though the organogram hasn't changed. Uh, but like the conversations in the hallway are a lot more about quality, about um, lead time, about things like that. Um, and I've been really impressed that um, like because there's a lot less inventory, um, all our problems become more visible. For example, we have a centralized DB team. So every uh, database change has to go through them, um, which for everybody on the inside, it's very clear that this is not the best idea because it creates a lot of ping pong and communication and it's a constant source for errors, etc. But like on the, on the third two weekly release, we had a big problem with database scripts not being um, executed correctly, which caused a delay in the release just a few days, so it's not really a big deal. Um, but this was now suddenly visible to the business and also to management. And suddenly after years of complaining about this, suddenly the management demanded that we took action that this couldn't happen again. So this the picture of this little boat hitting the, the, the iceberg or not, is uh, I was impressed by uh, how I, that it actually happened like that. All right, so closing up this story, just something I want to stress. Uh, again, for all you internal change agents, that this was a very much bottom-up driven uh, initiative. And I'm pretty sure that even today, some of the management wish it had never happened. Like somehow some of them still managed to not see the value of this continuous delivery, but only the, the problems that it uncovered. Either way, it was an experience that taught me that if you keep pushing gently in all directions, that sometimes people simply forget to stop you. And if you've been very transparent and very forthcoming and open in your communication, then once you've moved forward, then nobody can really force you to step back anymore. So be creative. And if nobody forces you to stop, make sure not to stop yourself. Secondly, uh, we all know that a big organization is hard to get moving but you can use this inertia to your advantage. Our community was small and fast to decide to act, so fast that any obstacle that was thrown in our path was avoided. Like by the time that I had to present this project to the, the board of directors, etc., we were already uh, in January, so it was easy to convince them that all the risks were under control, because I could say, and actually the release we did the other week uh, happened without a problem. Um, and then finally, it really helps to bring an expert in, uh, an outsider who knows these problems, who's been there before, who doesn't force the solution, who doesn't execute the solution. Um, uh, and other than that, Thierry also served uh, as a rallying figure for us. Like we knew that our expert would come every Monday. So everybody just showed up for the work sessions on Mondays. And so this was somebody that we paid to do this. So even if he said the same thing that you've been saying for years, suddenly people would listen, right? Nobody is a prophet in their own land. Even Jesus said that. So I've learned to just accept this truth as a law of nature. And again, you have to find a way to use it to your advantage. Find somebody who says these things that you think are important, pay them lots of money, and then people will listen. So this, these were all the technical preparations um, that we did to get ready for less. Um, meanwhile, uh, so part of the of our organization, uh, so the payment teams, um, we would we started preparing to uh, to actually flip. Um, but since we already had cross-functional teams, um, not that much would change except that the scrum masters would not longer be embedded in the team and we would have one single PO. 
Um, so the actual flip then was pretty simple. We did a, a Lego simulation sometime in December. And then at the beginning of the year, we, um, let's see, at the beginning of the year, we had uh, one day of um, initial product backlog refinement and estimation where we estimated lots of uh, stories and issues. And the day after we got started with our first joint sprint planning. So perhaps this was the biggest event for uh, change for the teams, uh, all the events. Uh, for example, we started doing a sprint review with four teams together. Um, so we experimented a bit at, with the format. At first we would do presentation after presentation with some Q&A with some users that were actually brave enough to show up, show up. Then we tried something more bizarre style, but we needed a bit more structure than that. And then obviously since a few months, it all had to happen remotely. So right now we've kind of settled on a simple structure that seems to be working well. So we start simply start off with the whole group, with all the dev teams and some of the users and, and our PO, of course. We go over what was planned in the previous sprint. The teams say what they will be showing. Then we split up into anywhere between three to six breakout groups for about 30 minutes uh, to review uh, the features that have been delivered and, and what is left to do. After 30 minutes, we come back, we share for two minutes what we did in the, in the little groups. And we always end up with the question, if anybody has any other information that is important for the product backlog and, and priorities. Um, because we do the sprint planning in the afternoon, um, that makes it very natural to ask that question like okay are we now ready is the backlog ready for the next sprint uh, planning um we actually do both on mondays the, the planning itself is a bit more difficult than the review uh, again we experimented with with formats there and we've actually landed with a very similar structure as for the uh, review so we start our sprint planning with our people telling us about the backlog and the priorities and then we go over the main things with the whole group. Usually it's pretty clear which team will do which things, but uh, often there needs to be some more coordination for some parts. And then the teams go into their detailed planning for about half an hour. And, and again, we share for two minutes and we verify that the, the top priorities have been covered. And then at that moment, I usually try to fish for some commitment from the teams. But we're not very good yet at being predictable. Uh, so up to now, nobody bites. It's, uh, it's a work in progress. <laughs> um, but the most and probably most painful event uh, it feels like to me is the product backlog refinement. So every week uh, on Thursday morning, uh, we have a, a shared uh, product backlog refinement and learning to effectively collaborate and getting some actual stories out of this that, that are ready to be developed is quite difficult. And I think it has, has to do with what our product is really. So basically what we do is implementing social security laws. Uh, now I don't know if you've ever looked at any of the law texts, but they're quite complicated. Uh, they don't always make sense. Sometimes they are contradictory. There tend to be more exceptions and special cases than, than usual cases. Um, I think that's because laws are the result of a compromise between lots of different stakeholders. And in my mind, a compromise is rarely a good solution. It's usually just a solution that is equally bad for all the parties involved. Um, on top of that, Belgium is quite a complicated country. So our product and our business department uh, consist of many little departments with different language groups, different points of view, etc. So I can imagine all of that sounds quite unsexy. Um, but somehow our PO does manage to be in contact with all of these stakeholders. She manages to set clear priorities and she manages to communicate them in a very effective way, uh, as you can see here on the, on the left. Um, so having this one person doing this was a big change for us and it's still vital for our success. Uh, Old, I hope you're listening. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> excellent. Um, do you want to share with, with us uh, what it's like to be PO and, and what you do? For, for a few minutes? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Thanks for the, the introduction uh, about, about my role. So um, I can explain that, that for me, it's been quite a big adventure for the last year and a half. 
as the ICT came to uh, my department to, uh, to tell they would like a product owner from business side, which is great, of course. Um, um, and it, that it will be a full-time uh, position. So the first thing on our side, on business side, was to decide who would be the person to take that role and to make sure I have the mandate to make decision. Uh, of course, to, uh, I have to consult a lot of stakeholders and my management, but I have some freedom to, to choose the priorities and uh, adapt, uh, inspect and adapt, actually. Um, the, that was a difficult choice for me because I am not an expert on the content and uh, I chose to accept after a while uh, because uh, Scrum Master and ICT Director told me the, the most important skill would be the communication and also to have a network uh, in, the, in the company. Um, and I realized after, after an, a year and a half that uh, I think that's true <laughs> um, because I grew my knowledge bit by bit, uh, spending time with the team, spending time with the business expert and other stakeholders. Uh, and communication uh, helped me a lot in, uh, in getting better. Um, also, um, so I, I started uh, knowing not much. I, I knew a little bit uh, about the pension management, of course, but I thought it would, wouldn't be enough to, um, to build a vision and set up priorities. Um, what I wanted to say about this. So I started uh, first, um, I, what I wanted to say about the network is that I uh, work uh, before in the strategy department and in the PMO department at SFPD, which was useful to, and to have a, a view on the, on the largest strategy uh, in the company. Now just a few, a few more minutes. Um, I, it was not difficult to start uh, because I had uh, like an imposed backlog for a year. There was already a project for portfolio existing with a, a deadline, so I started with that. And then I uh, inspect and adapt actually each sprint and I uh, and uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, after a few months, I actually deleted some projects from the backlog because uh, I, I realized that it wasn't the most important. And I make sure I communicate this to uh, as much people as I can uh, to the top management. Um, so it triggers some reaction and um, and uh, it works. Uh, it's difficult. I have uh, some uh, difficult time sometimes to handle, uh, to handle the different department's needs. Uh, but the transparency and the communication helps a lot because they know where to find the information, they know who to contact if they really have problems, if uh, they need something from my teams to reach a deadline. Uh, to reach a deadline. Um, so that, uh, uh, that's good. What's been also interesting uh, is that I spend a lot of time with the teams and the Scrum Master. And uh, more and more, I feel like we are a big team. Uh, they guide me and also I guide them. And we uh, evolve all together uh, for the communication. For example, I, uh, I tell them that I really need uh, information about what's going on and to communicate those information uh, to my stakeholders. Uh, and it was difficult at the start because it's extra work to, for example, to uh, update the project board, to, uh, to the, the teams tell me that they don't have time to do something or they miss information, uh, they blocked. Uh, but it's very useful information for me to uh, share to the stakeholders and I can contribute to unblock uh, things or um, change some things so that we, we are better for the, the, next, uh, the next things. Um, I hope I am, I am clear enough. Feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> 
Voilà, so to finish, it's been, uh, it's been uh, a very tiring year and a half, but I'm very happy that I've accepted the role because uh, I learned a lot, uh, like in the human, I mean, um, in the collaborate, how to collaborate better and uh, also how to set up priorities and inspect and, and adapt continuously so that we deliver value um, every sprint. We're not there yet, but we, we try. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think the the communication aspect uh, is super important, and yeah, you can see you put a lot of time and effort into making this communication very clear. So that definitely helps. Um, and yeah, collaboration is not easy. It's a long process. I also feel that we're getting better at it. Um, also, as the Scrum Master, so uh, we have a little community of four Scrum Masters. Um, at the beginning, we spent a lot of time preparing all the events and there was hardly any time to do anything else. Um, but we, we learned that the more and more we allow the team to do things, the more they, they take things in, in hand as well. Um, and yeah, they're open to it now as well. They see some value in, in collaborating and they even suggest to other teams, maybe you can just come to our shared refinement. Um, even though it's painful and like we don't like necessarily to be in the refinement, but we see the value and maybe the fact that it's painful just shows that yeah, collaboration is difficult and there are no, there's no way around that. Um, so I think for me, that's the, the, the biggest lesson over the last uh, months uh, doing large scale scrum. Um, All right. So, so um, what what uh, Od also said is is uh, as she, she needs uh, lots of support and she's also looking for for support from from the IT department. Uh, so not not just for typing code, but for just the whole structure. So how how can they um, how can IT help me to to realize value? Yeah. Um, so for that we have uh, Stefan, the, the the director of the of the of the organization of well of the of the payments uh, department anyway. Um, together with the Scrum Master and actually with the whole teams, um, they came up with with uh, with an IT vision to say how can we support um, the, um, the, the the business and and all in, in specific, very specifically uh, in realizing uh, this uh, this value. Knowing that we have an, an application that is really um, uh, has gone through lots of um, uh, different visions on 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 how to deliver software. So we started out with with uh, with the vision that. Everything uh, should be de developed once, and it should be completely integrated. And and uh, and we have we have we, and we built a, a complete uh, monolith, which which in some context is a very good idea. But we we found out that if if your 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 environment is constantly moving, constantly evolving, and you need to live for a long uh, long uh, application, it's to live for a long time. And I I hope that the, uh, the Belgian pensioners will be paid for a long time in the future. So I think we're going to need this behavior a, a, a lot, and it is also we all, also we will always be changing. Eh? Uh, our politicians like to make uh, new laws and stuff like that. So we are constantly working in an application that needs to live, needs to work, and needs to change all the time. So for that, we came up with um, with a, a lean and efficient autonomous ICT, which is enabled by technical expertise and excellence, and it's driven by impact and value. So those are the, the key the key things we want to want to move for and for that we uh, we had we had some um, uh, so that, that was our, our, our direction uh, and we were looking for for um, for some support and that uh, how can we realize that and because having a big monolith having been developed over 10 years it's not a small thing to make it modular and and to, to make it a little bit more more flexible and easy to extend so one of the things we looked at is is um, there are some some capabilities that have been researched that have been found an organization that's very strong at, at these capabilities have a very profound effect on the performance of the whole organization, the business organization. So there is a clear link between the, the technical capabilities and the performance of an organization. So we started out investigating these, uh, these capabilities and seeing where can we improve, where, where should we get, uh, get better at. And one of the things we, uh, we noticed is during the refinement meetings, it was it was difficult to to bring IT and 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 business together. IT didn't understand uh, what, what uh, business didn't understand what IT was talking about. Very technical and, and all kinds of, of uh, jargon uh, going left and right. 
and, and uh, IT frustrated, well, they don't give us feedback. Yeah? So our biggest problem, that was a question, what, what's our biggest problem? Well, uh, this, uh, we, we don't understand each other. So we decided uh, to do an experiment to say, what if we would use something like uh, acceptance criteria as a ubiquitous language? Something that, that as, as an interface between what business needs and what IT can deliver. Because business uh, acceptance criteria, they, they can be used as, as a natural language to communicate what, what we really want. Uh, and it's also more able to, to express value with, it, with that. So given these acceptance criteria, that means um, this value can, uh, can, uh, can be delivered. But we have to learn how to express value like this because that, 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 that was a bit new. Right? We've, we've been writing tests and writing tests and stuff, but they were technical tests. It's just uh, saying, okay, does this component work with that component and does it do it in that, that way? So we have to learn that. Uh, and if we can express ourselves in this language, that means this is a structured language, so that means we can automate that. So we, we decided uh, we wanted to have our safety net, we had a safety net, uh, but we need the safety net to also serve as living documentation. So, okay, let's see uh, what, what happened there. So um, we found out if we were looking at our, at our, at our safety net is, well, we, we have a safety net. We have 8,000 unit tests and 3,000 integration tests, but the unit tests we don't understand. And in the integration tests, they sometimes fail, they sometimes succeed, but, but they're not stable. They don't give us stable feedback. Um, so if you look a bit at, at this overview, we had um, coverage at the top where we have some, some manual testing and some, some, uh, some spot testing and, and integration testing going on. And we have some unit tests on, on the bottom, but we are really missing the core here. The core being tests that express your, your functionality uh, and verify the, the behavior that can be run on a decoupled system. The majority of the, of the current tests are now running on a deployed system, meaning your feedback loop is very long. So that didn't help us. So we decided the next best thing to, uh, to, uh, to do on a technical level is to develop unit tests that can run fast and, and, and in, 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 on, on mass without interrupting each other, um, but expressing functional uh, behavior, not technical uh, mumbo jumbo. So yeah, how do you do that? Well, we need, we need to learn some stuff. So we started um, with, uh, with Akata. Akata is, is just a, a, a place and, and, uh, in, in, in time and uh, in, in space, basically, where uh, developers, volunteers come together and learn about patterns and, and smells. But what are patterns? These are re, uh, code structures, technical structures that you can recognize and reuse. And smells are parts of the code that, that are difficult to, uh, to evolve. And, and, and so we're learning about this language, about patterns and smells so that you can communicate about it and um, uh, in, improve a little bit more. So one of the most important patterns is uh, the single responsibility principle. Um, and another one is, is open close and being able to extend on, on current behavior instead of constantly having to tweak uh, current behavior. Um, the difficulty is how to do that in, in, in your actual real life code, uh, because there everything is entangled already. So we started out with very simple standard, uh, standard katas. For example, the Mars rover kata is just a simple challenge uh, with no, uh, no other complexities, just learn to see and develop the patterns. So we decided to say, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's do this, uh, these exercises and let's do them regularly. Every Thursday afternoon, there's two, hour of, uh, two hours available where everyone can just join. And we will have these kinds of sessions, like you see here, where we were working in pair. If the, if the group is very large, and we, we will form several pairs and we, we do the, the challenges. Or if the group is a little bit smaller, we actually do mobbing. That means we, we do one challenge with the whole group together. So we also learn how to collaborate in these things. So um, when we started learning about these patterns, we started thinking, okay, but how can we apply this, this knowledge to, to, our, to our code base, to, to, our, to our system? So, okay. Uh, we came up with, uh, with the concept of a verifiable, uh, verified unit test. A verified unit test is actually a unit test that uh, verifies behavior, not technical things, but behavior. So we came up with, we want, we want to, um, uh, we had a goal saying we want to in, uh, increase uh, the number of, of, uh, of unit tests, uh, these kind of unit tests, and decrease the number of integration tests that are in quarantine, because from the 3,000 tests, integration test there are only 500 and I think today even 250 um, actually stable so those are the ones that are ran continuously uh, and guarding our our build that's not that's not much eh? three, three, 250 um, uh, integration tests that's not really enough so next step that we did is uh, we formed mobs a mob is actually 
similar like Ekata, it's a two hour uh, time slot that teams can plan. In their planning, they say, okay, we're gonna do one, two, three, or four, or five um, of these mobbing sessions. And it's um, a two hour time boxes that each team plans in their sprint with volunteers with any skill set. So we'll always be mobbing in, the, in, this, um, in this thing. That means everyone is working on a single problem, on a single, a single thing. So the team also agrees to say, okay, that for example, this is a, a team, uh, the Amon team saying, okay, this is uh, the kind of, of quality that we want to guarantee. Uh, that this is what the, the checks that we're going to, to, to look for when we are creating and saying this is a verified unit test. These are the things that we are checking for. This is the procedure that we are handling to, uh, to, make, that, to make that actually happen. So um, it also was uh, so because we have lots of, 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 of different um, uh, parts in the code and actually nobody's really an owner of it, but we said, okay, let's, let's define some areas that a team takes guardianship of, at least for, the, for, for now, and make the unit tests of, those, of, that, uh, of that area um, of a higher quality. Yeah. So once defined that, we started using these, uh, these, uh, these mobbing sessions. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that, that come out is, is okay, um, we, we bump into, into a problems, like for example, like, like this one here. So you see in the gray area, it's a bit, I can't zoom in much more. Uh, but we see that there's, there's um, a kind of behavior hidden away through, uh, after a lot of plumbing uh, code saying, okay, but if we have this information from, from, from our system, then this behavior needs to be uh, tackled and that needs to be reported to that system. But in order to create tests to set up all this system was massively complicated. So one of the things we said, okay, we could arrange and say, okay, delegate the actual behavior out to a new domain, which can be unit tested in a very simple way, very light way, so that at least the plumbing codes might not be very well tested, but at least the behavior is expressed in, in a way that even business can understand. We use these unit tests, um, even in the, refine, in, in the, in the, in the review uh, meetings where you can see, given this, uh, this specific uh, context, that's the result that we actually, actually want. We also learn how to visually uh, design and document in, in those mobbing sessions, because uh, for example, uh, once we have built this, uh, this, this new library, this new, this new package, we can start thinking about, well, we could place this package behind, behind um, uh, make, it a, make it a microservice. We can make it available. So we start to, to poke away parts, uh, we call it strangulation. We, we, we're starting to carve away some behavior from the, from the, the, the big beast. Um, and, um, but this is a plan still, so we're working towards it, so that, that we can disentangle um, parts from, from, uh, from the large monolith, and so that this becomes uh, a unit on itself, and with a single responsibility of, it, of its own. Um, so those kinds of things are, are starting to, uh, to, to, to happen. Um, and also there, I think we do it in, in, uh, in group, in, in mobs. Uh, today, uh, we, we used to, to start with uh, physically, but now we're doing it remotely. And if we find that even remote, it's even, it's even uh, stronger. Uh, it, it's easier, we have more effects uh, in the mobbings than we had physically. So it's an interesting uh, development. Um, also things that, that we discover is, okay, given um, that we want to work in, in, um, in, 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 in extracting information from, from uh, the big thing to, to more manageable structures, we start to introduce concepts like domain-driven design, which is, which is completely focused on expressing your functionality, your, 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 your code structures in the language of your business. Yeah, so these things are introduced during the mobbing sessions and the kata sessions, which allows me as a coach to really be hands-on and, um, and, and, and um, work on problems together with the teams with, and just add my knowledge to, uh, to, to their knowledge because they know about the context and I know about these patterns. So uh, that's how we help each other. Um, and interesting enough, so once we, we, we bump into issues and patterns in the, in, the, in the mobbing session, we just continue because we don't want to deliver but we bring those issues to the, to the katas as well. And so what we realized uh, after a while is the katas, the simple katas were a bit too simple. Uh, and we started out, can we make it more complicated and more, more complex and a more real kata so we can exercise, so we can uh, experiment a little bit more and deeper. And so what we then did, the katas now evolve around building a game. It's a, it's a kind of racing game with some simple rules. We, uh, we together uh, learned how to create a story map, uh, how to create, how to derive uh, a walking skeleton from it. We use the C4 mechanism to, um, or mechanism, the, the C4 way of, of uh, expressing uh, and designing our architecture. Uh, so what you can see here is a simple application uh, with, uh, with some front ends and some uh, back end. Um, and this back end is uh, made of three parts. 
And this in, in, the, in the last uh, stage, you can see it's actually like a zooming, uh, a zooming uh, uh, system. Um, there's a lot to tell about the, the C4 uh, uh, thing. So every, every diagram has its own uh, reason for existence so that you don't have overlap in, uh, of, of too much overlap in all these things. And so we use during the cat, we, we are reflecting on, okay, does this still reflect the right? Um, the right I can, you, can you zoom in anymore? Is it possible? Oh, I, this is I, I can't zoom in uh, for oh, okay sorry but we can we can organize a kata like this if you'd like <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's very very fun to do uh it it, it, it really it, it starts it, you build it up together as a team so this solution is just specific for the way the team thought at that moment so it's not the right solution or anything um but it's just a way to, to think about and also to think about because we were we were working on this in in, in a kata what we were i was talking about uh, immutability uh item potency um, about all these kinds of things and, and race conditions and stuff. At a certain, certainly at uh, certainly at, at, uh, at one of the mobs following those those katas, someone said, "But actually, we also can have race conditions in our case." Oh yes. So, so we started realizing, and they, these things feed each other. So we learn in the katas, we apply them in the mobs, we learn again in the katas, and so it, it feeds each other. Um, we're not only learning from from ourselves or from coaches uh, like me. We also reach out and, and uh, connect to, to, uh, to other organizations to learn together. So for example, we organized, uh, Tom and me together, we organized what we call a Socrates software craftsmanship and testing meetups. Uh, it used to be every, every uh, other month until the COVID thing uh, blew up. Uh, so uh, we didn't uh, continue it anymore. Uh, but that's why what, uh, what what started up is to, to really get other people in like like today together and say okay this is our situation uh, what's your situation how can we learn from each other another thing is often developers just work with the, with the, with the architecture that that they that they're given we have, we have not much opportunity to learn what could be a better architecture so we organized an architectural kata with three organizations among others uh, ysoft and um, uh, the sfpd and and uh, uh, Fluvius, uh, it's another another company we are we are we are guiding, uh, and and there we we, we had a, an architectural kata, so it's a kata on architectural level, so not not on behavior, but really on, on how to structure your code. Another thing is very important is how to organize um, your your dev and ops together. We, we we know the word the the, the new buzzword of DevOps. Um, well, it's not that new anymore, but for some people it still is. Um, it's actually. The, uh, creating the, the, the ability to deliver value on business demand. Yeah, so whenever business needs it, we can deliver it. Delivering is, uh, releasing is becomes a non-issue. But that's not a simple thing. So what we organized is uh, uh, like, like a simulation together with Gaming Works. It's an organization that, that's, uh, that, that uh, is creating simulations uh, to, um, to, to augment the, 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 the things that the learnings during a training, during a training, just here stuff you try and theoretically you absorb it and then later you try to to, uh, to apply it. With this uh, simulation, you actually are are brought into a context um, uh, that really lets you experience the problems that you experience every day in your daily life as a developer or as an as an architect or as a, as, a, as a manager uh, or as a product owner, um, and and see okay what if we would organize this in a different way and then see the effect of that and so I'll feel the effect of that and so. Um, we have we had this training already, and we made it uh, we made it available to do it remotely, uh, so that that gave us two two uh, two benefits. It's learning how to do this all this thing, all this uh, working together and delivering software and value in a remote way, and uh, and also it allowed us to 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 try out it. How can we bring this simulation also in um, in in a remote way? And, and at least from uh, from what I've learned from it, it was uh, quite successful. And um, that's basically how how we try to to um, to tune up our technical excellence. Um, another thing that we noticed is that that um, um, well we we are, we we used to be hiring uh, people based on some parameters and those parameters have shifted. Eh? So we are, we are now looking for people who are um, uh, enthusiastic to 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 take initiative um, to to communicate. And so those are parameters that are more more and more important. So whenever we we, we, we want to restart or we, we're going to get extra people uh, in, in, uh, in joining us. We're now looking for different parameters. Um, and so recently we had, we had two people joining with, uh, with, with very high skills at, uh, at, at all these things that we are doing. So instead of only learning, because if everyone has to learn everything, that's a lot. So we try to inject the team with some people that already have a lot of knowledge of this 
um, thinking in in, uh, in 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 ways that that that, uh, that really click together. So it's it's learning, it's doing, it's it's having uh, more people uh, involved um, with already the, the experience and the knowledge. Eh? Because a single coach for uh, like me for for 40 people, that's a bit much. Uh, so we really need more people in the teams that also can carry and 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 drive it uh, every day while while we're working. So what we have seen is that uh, this, this whole less thing, it, it's quite much, <laughs> quite a lot. Um, and so it's important to, to find out, okay, how can we stay sane in this, uh, in this context? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, less is really striving to, to, um, to find the least possible structure and the least, least amount of, of, uh, of, of fuss in order to, uh, to make this whole thing work. Um, but one of the, the so five, five things that we need to take in, take in mind is, we are dealing with people. We are dealing with people in stress situations. So patience and setting low expectations is is um, is important. Um, so don't burn yourself up against this machine. You, with, with patience and with with persistence, you get much further than with with high energy. Uh, so again, that persistence just just continue. Like Tom said, as long as you're not stopped, you continue. And if you're stopped, you just move in another direction and you just wobble around it. Yeah. Of course, if you're stopped, it's important to to take in. Okay, is there information there? Or is it only fear and and uh, and and the old world uh, old paradigm thinking? So it's important to 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 listen. Um, so that needs a lot of courage. You need to, you need to really step up out of your comfort zone and being able to work with uncertainty, because all we know in software is that everything is uncertain. It's, it's we don't we just can't predict it. Uh, and a sense of humor also <laughs> helps a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's keeping, uh, we're all under stress already. So, so adding this and changes is adding more stress. So sometimes, so, so uh, pull, the, pull the plug and, and, uh, and lighten, lighten up is an important part. And, and lead by example, by being open and humble. Uh, I might be an experienced coach, but I really do not know all the things that are necessary to make it, to make it work. And, and in my interactions with, uh, with people, I, I keep this very, very, very much in mind. It's not something that I say, it's something that I need to show and really feel. So I need to, to, to be open and humble, otherwise people will see me as a, as a fraud. So, um, and I personally, I had to learn all these things because previously I was very impatient. I, I, once I had an insight, I wanted the whole, my whole environment to also have this, have this insight and just go. Um, and that just burns people up and get games, gets more and more frustration. So that's basically, what we wanted to uh, to share with you in uh, one direction and now we would like to uh, to move in towards two directions uh, and get into a conversation and we would like to do that uh, with with uh, breakout rooms we will have three breakout rooms at the same time uh, we will have a sharing moment uh, after 15 minutes and then we will have another uh, three parallel uh, things so we will uh, there have been some questions or remarks have been captured already by by christoph and um so we will be able to see, I hope, yeah, on, um, on each of the rooms, we will be talking about a specific topic. And so what you would like, what we would like you to do is to choose which topic speaks most to you and then join the breakout room uh, that will be prepared or is prepared. I'm not really sure about that, um, where we will then um, have a conversation about it.